if you don't submit um, to control, if you're a, a radical, you're less likely to be loved. Um, you're not fitting in with society. Um, you're viewed as an outsider. Um, there, so there's a lot of um, uh, social prohibitions about the outsider and the, and the person who's going to upset things. From the time we're very young, we're taught to you know, worship authority, basically, because that's our key to survival as young children. But as adults, we never go through the rites of passage that tell us how to methodically think for ourselves, and thus we're always in a state of extended adolescence. Well, we take all this stuff, whether it's the television or it's the enculturation, the, the schoolyards, the teachers, we take this whole system, we put it into our unconscious mind. And it is the G-I-G-O that comes out, garbage in, garbage out. We simply, in that computer language, have harnessed our own power by accepting all these beliefs as though they are factual. Whether it's the flat earth of uh, Columbus, or it's the idea that I'm not good enough to be or to do something I've dreamed to do. To the degree that the individual loses a sense of what freedom really means for himself, mind control is working. This is the constant battle and the struggle. What does my freedom mean to me? What is it? How deep does it go? How far reaching is it? Individuals come already with their rights. They're born with their rights. They're inherent. They're, they're hardwired. They're hardware. It's tragic. They've lost their sense of the importance of the individual. Each individual. We're not animals. We're individuals. We're created in the image of God. And so what you have is everybody's born into this control structure. Everybody's born into authority. Everyone's born into this situation. But just because you have an authority making decisions for you at some point when you're very young, too young to take care of yourself, doesn't mean you should always cater to authority your whole life. Fatalism, defeatism, what Barb Morley called mental slavery. That was a huge thing that he would sing about. How do we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery? Have we moved to that point of such slavery that we're too far gone? And just kind of letting it all flow by and being apathetic about it just gets you in a position of being controlled. You know, there are some people that don't care. There are some people that don't know and don't want to know. It is very frightening. If you really look at it, you would only be, you would be left with the understanding that you were obligated to do something about it. And, you know, People work really hard every day, and they just want to relax and enjoy their life. We have established a framework for, for the most part, works pretty good. People enter into this contract with society. Uh, that contract allows them to, to follow certain rules and expect certain uh, returns on their investment of working within the framework of the, con the contract. Human beings form habits. At some point in our lives, many of us realize that the lives we are living are not those which we have imagined, but rather lives reflecting others' imaginations, as if we have been unwitting actors in someone else's script. Are we acting out the artificial roles created by others who have successfully harnessed our minds through our habits? To answer that question, one must first learn how the minds of individuals can be harnessed by systems of psychological control. Are the habits reflected by human beings in direct conflict with their needs to survive and thrive in this world? The enormous implications deter many of us from asking these simple questions and finding answers relevant to our daily lives. If we don't resist uh, all of the different information that comes our way and weigh it and, and use our own mind instead of what somebody else wants us to think, eventually uh, society will become nothing more than automatons, robots. The establishment has so, it's protected itself unless you submit to the saturation indoctrination and ab adopt all its values. You can't get in. Everyone needs to find out and really think about it. What is going too far? Because all of this is happening so fast, you need to be ahead of the game. They're ahead of the game. Humans subjugate themselves to control because they're born into it. And the tyrants and the social engineers know how to incrementally begin to slowly ratchet up 
the manipulation, the domination, uh, the oppression, so that people never really recognize it coming. It's the old analogy of the frog in the boiling pot. You throw a frog into a boiling pot, folks in Louisiana will tell you this, a bullfrog, he'll jump out. But if you put him in a cold pot, turn it on simmer, heat it up slow, he'll boil, and he'll never see it coming. Well, I think it has a lot to do with group collectivism, and like, go back to John Dewey, you know, he hated the individual. He hated the rugged individualism of Americans. They had to get rid of that. And Carnegie very deeply involved in that. They even talk about getting rid of that, huh? And so I think that when you've been reduced to uh, a member of the group, the collective, whether it's through sensitivity training that teachers have to go through or whether, you know, it's in your own community, like we have a community-oriented policing system, you know, where they give you a medal. If you do a good deed, well, you know, you're, you're part of the collective with the police. I would say in the next 50 years, if large numbers of people don't become consciously resistant to the overall mind control exerted on society, we're going to see many more people who really truly resemble androids. People induce this themselves by looking out at the world and saying, it's too dangerous for me to tell the truth or to say what I really believe or express how I really feel. It's much better if I fabricate a completely synthetic personality that's going to sit back here and remain passive. That's how it works. The idea of, of short-term gain, basically giving up freedoms. Freedoms, giving up freedoms is never a good idea. Since the dawn of time, small groups of human beings have instilled artificial circular limitations on the minds of their subjects through the procession of history. Traditionally, the limitations are imprinted on the servile population through a cunning use of language, instruction, and media for the purposes of conquest social cohesion, and authoritative order by harnessing the human resources of the broad population. Human history reflects countless stories, regardless of what era you happen to live in, and the common thread throughout these stories is that of the struggle between the state, whatever its form, and the individual, the goal of which is to harness and subsume the individual, willingly or unwillingly, into its group collective. The role of authority is a predatory system that sees the individual basically as a unit of energy. The first forms of mind control go back to prehistory. And you would simply have a priest class that uh, developed technologies of herbs and medicine and had a value to the tribe. But pretty soon the priest class would start uh, studying the sky and when there were solar and lunar eclipses and would say, hey, uh, the sun's not going to come back on this date unless you make me king or unless you give me total control. And the people would say, okay, we saw the eclipse when you said it was coming. You know, the snake god ate the sun of the moon. What do you want? I want your firstborn child. Sacrifice him to me. Every culture does that. Every culture at one time or another demands human sacrifice because that's the state or the priest class demanding absolute, total, fealty and submission to it. Mind control has existed since the dawn of time. Only the methods have changed. Elites have always known, if I can control the minds of my people, I control them. Only the technology has changed. It's still the same program. It's never stopped. Sun Tzu, uh, within the, the, the works of the art of war, talk about the fact that if you can understand your enemy so well to the level of where you can psych him out, basically defeat him before you put one boot on the battlefield, you, you've become a true master of your domain. The Greek author Plato embedded several key characteristics of ruling groups in his monumental work known as the Republic. Therein, he introduces the term cybernetics as a description of steering the ship of state Emphasizing crowd control, Plato memorialized the essence of the scenario used to control individuals to this day, to make them part of the group or state. This is famously known as the allegory of the cave, a useful strategy which is emblematic of the history of mind control. 
The idea of cybernetics first shows up in Plato's Republic, I believe it's book six, and in the Greek original text it's read kybernetes, but you can easily discern how this word tied into cybernetics, the control of not only nations, but how the making of individuals into the collective that forms the nations came about. As we've moved through history, every great leader has had to understand the, the potential of information, the potential of speech, the potential of words, the potential of books. What is a citizen, if not someone willingly or unwillingly participating in the machinations of the state? How would we acquire the habits of citizenship without stimulus from the state and our response to it? In an attempt to assist the state, a 14th century Italian named Niccolo Machiavelli crafted several books intended to help the ruling elite dominate their subjects with the most effective psychological warfare techniques available to the world at that time. And he was trying to convert the Medici family into hiring him to provide political advice. Conspiracy is the story of history. It's the story of plunderers taking care of people who produce. They claim to take care of them through government, which doesn't give you anything. It doesn't take away first. So it's not creating something out of nothing. It's very real what they're doing. They're taking your rights or taking some people's rights and adding more to someone else's rights. Concurrent to Machiavelli's efforts, the consequences of tyranny were sowing the seeds of liberty throughout Europe with authors like Etienne de la Boetie of France leading individuals to consider their situations and discover effective means to achieving liberty for all. So this whole idea of Machiavelli telling the ruling elite how to do this in a more efficient and you know, uh, you know, effective manner without people directly knowing about it. But his mistake is that these books get out there and other people start to read these books because it's not just the ruling elite. Uh, this starts to have an influence in Europe. You've got a character named Etienne de la Boetie who writes a discourse on voluntary servitude. And basically what de la Boetie does is he shows you that everything that Machiavelli told the ruling elite about how to control you is undone when you understand it to the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts level where you can then withdraw your consent and that on, only then are you free. We control you. We control your mind. We make you believe you have no creative power. We make you forget you have imagination, which is the core capability from which you can invent your own reality. The myriad components of collectivism combine to form a comprehensive system for transforming the individual into a cog within the machinery of the state. The first step is to remove self-reliance, thus creating dependence on the state or collective. The next step is to create a motivation based on fear of scarcity, as opposed to creativity and productivity. Remove the systems of autonomy, creativity, and self-teaching, which help create individuality in the first place. And the void is filled by the will of the collective. Nature abhors a vacuum, and the mind is no different. Innovative and enigmatic German philosopher of the 19th century, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, observed that human history could be manipulated to create a contrived outcome. Hegel's essential observations of the methods by which history may be authored by a small group translate into a world in which an individual's choices may be engineered away from his needs. How to engineer the opinion of the American people so that they would fully endorse, not only endorse, but demand a war. Right, right oh, there's now. another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> right, oh, oh my gosh. <gasps> another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Flew right into the middle of it. Explosion. So it's problem. The people then beg for it. That's reaction. And then it's 
solution, which is centralizing more control. Create the problem, people scream, you couldn't impose any solution you want on people. One recent practical example of the use of Hegel's method for control is that of the infamous underwear bomber. I'm Kurt Haskell, I'm a Michigan attorney, and I'm more well known as being the main eyewitness to the underwear bomber event on Christmas Day 2009. I saw two men approach the desk. One looked like a poor African man, or maybe late, late teenager, and one looked like a uh, wealthier Indian looking man who had on a tan suit. They were walking together and I just thought they were a weird pair and I was wondering why the two were together and I listened to their conversation as they went up to the desk and talked to the airline worker. When they went up there, just the Indian man spoke and he said, uh, this man needs to get on the flight but he doesn't have a passport. And then the, uh, the airline worker said, well, he can't get on the flight without a passport. And then the Indian man kind of argued with her saying, well, he's from Sudan and we do this all the time. The student from Nigeria smuggled explosives onto a flight in his underwear. <laughs> Prosecutors staged a demonstration of what might have happened, but something went wrong. Abdul Mutalab's trousers burst into flames. Passengers and crew grabbed him. The plane landed safely. The source has confirmed that Farouk Matalab is the son of Alaji Matalab, one, former chairman of one of Nigeria's biggest, wealthiest, and most respected banks, First Bank of Nigeria. As soon as this happens, we see Mr. Chertoff all over the news and TV everywhere promoting these body scanning machines. But there are a few things we could do to make things better. First, we could deploy the scanning, the scanning machines that we currently are beginning to deploy in the U.S. that would give us the ability to see what someone has concealed underneath their clothing. To meet agendas in conflict with the needs of individuals, the ruling class creates an artificial crisis to which the public reacts by begging for the ruling class to intervene. The ruling class then enjoys the plunder made possible by removing the self-reliance from individuals. Good morning, everybody. Today's hearing is the third in a series of subcommittee hearings focused on some of the causes and consequences of the 2008 financial crisis, a man-made economic assault on our country that is still foreclosing on homes, shuttering businesses, and driving unemployment. The combined philosophies of Thomas Malthus, Charles Darwin, and Herbert Spencer led to the development of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism grafted the concept of the survival of the fittest onto the larger social framework. Claims of biological advantages or superiority could then be advanced as justification for future economic policy relating to the poor and as the basis of Francis Galton's pseudoscience of eugenics in the 20th century. So Darwin comes along about 150 years ago and comes out with his theories on where life comes from and then it's survival of the fittest and that the best organisms are able to survive in a competitive environment and uh, move forward in the evolutionary chain. And whether that theory is correct or partially correct or totally wrong is a side issue. The robber barons, the British royalty, uh, the J.P. Morgans of the world publicly adopted the idea of Darwinism and merged it with predatory eugenics. And the eugenicists who have always been looking for scientific causes to justify their sinning, if you will, that's what they found so useful in Darwin's work is they said, we've already had this belief system that we're better than you but we now have science to back it up. Our entire current civilization, what we know as globalism, the new world order, is based on eugenics scientists that developed their theories in the last 200 years, mainly in England, Germany, and the United States. The entire science of genetics, biometrics, uh, eugenics, uh, computers, all of it came out of the search for a system of total control over humanity. So the issue with eugenics is it claims to be a science of self-adaptation self for human species. So it sounds like a great thing if you're an individual. You want to make yourself better. If you reproduce, you want your kids to be strong and survive. However, the people who are doing it 
are taking and making a bunch of decisions for other people and violating volition and their free will all over the place because that's their modus operandi. In his 1928 book, The Open Conspiracy, former British psychological warfare expert H.G. Wells wrote, the political world of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, and supersede existing governments. The character of the open conspiracy will then be plainly displayed. It will be a world religion. This large, loose, assimilatory mass of groups and societies will definitely and obviously attempt to swallow up the entire population of the world and become a new human community. The immediate task before all people, a planned world state, is appearing as a thousand points of light, but generations of propaganda and education may have to precede it. The government of England put massive funding towards the study of humans, and not just medicine, but human behavior. And so all the sciences that the British Empire used on countries that it was attacking and regions it was conquering were also turned inward against their own populations. In 1948, Eric Blair, the British journalist and author who assumed the nom de plume of George Orwell, wrote the iconic dystopian novel 1984. In it, Orwell outlined a collectivist future governed by technocrats in which a big brother totalitarian state maintains control of society through constant panopticon-inspired surveillance, fueled by a perpetual war and emboldened by both covert and overt forms of mind control and mass persuasion. The premise of the panopticon, it was an architectural design that was set up to maximize the power of surveillance. So if the prisoners didn't know, they could never tell if they were actually being watched at any one time, so they would have to assume that they were always being watched. Through 1984, Orwell introduced the concept of newspeak into popular culture, a debased language structure that would suppress the ability of the masses to upset the power of the state by regulating their thoughts through an illusory police force known as the Thought Police. Orwell's notion of doublespeak demonstrated the cognitive dissonance inherent in tyrannical structures. As the meanings of the words change, the meaning in society is lost. And fortunately, we have been able to raise our standard of living without sacrificing the spiritual side of life, which means so much to the American family. Thomas Henry Huxley, the man known as Darwin's Bulldog, produced a number of grandchildren, the two best known and most influential being Julian and Aldous Huxley. Sir Julian Huxley, an evolutionary biologist, was elected as the first director general of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, and also served as both vice president and president of the British Eugenics Society. So the Huxley family is highly interesting because T.H. Huxley is the teacher over H.G. Wells who becomes a famous protege. But Huxley's whole family is not only intermarried and working on these eugenics ideas themselves, but they have, uh, you know, he has a, a famous son and grandson and, and all sorts of famous cousins that tie into the Darwin Wedgwood family. So notably, you have Aldous Huxley who coins the phrase Brave New World in 1932 with his novel, which is really describing a technocratic future by which people are pharmaceutically drugged into loving their servitude. I think what, what is going to happen in the future is the dictators will find, as the old saying goes, that you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. That if you want to preserve your power indefinitely, you have to get the consent of the ruled. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in, uh, in Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. Uh, they will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man, and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even and so making him actually love his slavery I mean I think this is the danger that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime but they will be happy in situation where they oughtn't to be happy 
Leveraging the fact that the 20th century opened up numerous avenues for shaping and controlling the thoughts and behaviors of the population, the ruling elite contrived new ways of obscuring useful facts while peddling useless ideas to the American people. Advertising, in addition to fundamental changes in education, produced a population of non-thinkers whose false understanding of basic concepts instilled through public schooling led to generations of people who feel they are magically endowed with the ability to somehow attain knowledge without first observing the landscape of available, credible evidence. One such artifact of credible evidence which demonstrates that our lives are being scripted by the ruling class is a 1966 textbook authored by Georgetown professor Dr. Carol Quigley, titled Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. In it, Quigley details a secret society partially funded by central banker Lord Rothschild, enacted by Cecil Rhodes and led by Lord Alfred Milner and the Round Table Journal of International Affairs, which Quigley terms the Milner Group. The first questions most people ask upon hearing of such a book are, why is it so important? And why do so few know about its existence? This is a key book. It's almost like the Rosetta Stone to decode everything they're doing. It's over a thousand pages long with incredible you know, documentation in the bibliography of how this ruling elite based out of Britain is using a full spectrum dominance model to fund the communists, to fund the fascists, to fund the Democrats, to fund the Republicans, so that there looks like there's a choice, but everything really is moving towards collectivism for the general public, while the elite themselves are exempt from all their own rules. These are the ideas of people who plunder that care not about laws or boundaries or nations or your rights. They see might makes right. And so when Cecil Rhodes goes in and creates Rhodesia, and you know, you have South Africa and the De Beers whole cartel of diamonds and gold. And then you look at who Cecil Rhodes left his will to, who funded him to get on there and do that. You keep coming back to the historical central bankers that have been manipulating world events as we've been taught them for at least you know, since the beginning of our country, 1776, 1790 is when they start to gain a foothold. They then come over in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, pre-Civil War, gain a stronger foothold. And by the end of the Civil War, we're completely switched over to a system that we had fought 60 years before to overthrow. Once the power structure got all the best and brightest students of the world and put them through Rhodes Scholar type programs, not just in England, but in other nations, they could then control the brain trust and have a fully programmed new generation to take control of the governmental, corporate, and media systems to carry out the program. Their goal was to dominate all of those major power centers quietly behind the scenes. And by moving the leadership in a certain direction, then they knew that they could control the masses without the masses even knowing that they're being dominated and led by a very small, powerful elite group. In further pursuit of the science of controlling human resources, the last will and testament of Cecil Rhodes spawned the Pilgrim Society in both America and England, which created a global brain trust. Its goal? To assert global control by dividing its tasks into working groups, such as the Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg Group, and Trilateral Commission throughout the 20th century. In more recent history, the long-held beliefs of the ruling class regarding control of the individual's body by the undermining of his mental abilities were then furthered by the technological breakthroughs of the 19th and 20th centuries. In the 19th century, the Prussian government conducted research into the study of how to make individuals compliant cogs in the machine of their conflict-based empire. Prussian psychologist Wilhelm Wundt determined that the individual human being has no soul and can thus be programmed like an automaton or robot. You see, the social engineers don't need us under social Darwinism. We're scum to be removed. We are seen as nothing but biological androids or replicants 
from the Philip K. Dick book to Androids Dream of Electric Sheep turned into Blade Runner. We're just seen as dumbed down biological workers. When individual identity has been forsaken, it is much easier to compartmentalize the minds of those being controlled. Various personages throughout history have described the human being as a machine, but it was the synergy amongst the work of Wilhelm Wundt, Ivan Pavlov, and many others, which scientifically quantified the individual as soulless, thus justifying manipulation to plunder individuals of their rights, transforming individuals into human resources. Our system is copied from a 1819 Prussian system that's a three-tiered education system. One tier is for the intellectual elite. The second tier is for the servers of the intellectual elite. They would be the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers. And the, the last tier is for the lay. It's for the masses. Education, as we know it, is nothing more than mind control. It is the science of control. And the British scientists, the eugenicists, came up with systems to dumb people down and make them submissive. But the uh, German model, in fact, namely the Prussian model, that was designed to create soldiers that were owned by the state, but that were so brainwashed, they were proud to go off and march into musket fire. That system known as kindergarten is the whole basis of modern Western education. How do you measure the achievement of a nation? If you want to know how we're really doing, take a look at our schools. For on what we're doing here and in schools throughout the world rests not only our future fate, but perhaps the very fate of civilization itself. Building upon this dehumanization of individuals to the animal state of stimulus response, Russian researcher Ivan Pavlov and American researcher John B. Watson conducted experiments based on classical conditioning, a simple manipulation of reflexes under observable conditions. These methods were then improved and perfected by Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner was also one of these uh, famous American behaviorists, and he championed something called operant conditioning. Again, just a fancy jargon term for some basic common sense. And operant conditioning was really all about negative reinforcements like timeouts, positive reinforcements like food pellets and money, and, and punishments, which are like punishment shocks. This operant conditioning doesn't work so good on anti-authoritarians, people who challenge and resist authority. Um, and later on, research has shown that operant conditioning works best, works best on people who are dependent, infantilized, in other words, made like children. When you ask yourself as a teacher, as I have at the college level, what have I got that my students want? Uh, it's sometimes a pretty discouraging uh, question. But you can uh, discover things which will be reinforcing to students at any level. And that has been done. A great deal of progress has been made. There are things in an ordinary, uh, even, say, a ghetto classroom, the lower grades or high school, uh, that can be used as reinforcers. Uh, you can have special foods at lunchtime, uh, access to play space, uh, privileges to associate with, with other kids of your choice. Uh, more and more of these things have been brought into play as, as the kinds of contrived reinforcers that can be used temporarily to get the kinds of behavior which will then eventually have their own natural consequences which will be reinforcing. One of the notable things that separates human beings from other inhabitants of this planet uh, that we call animals is our ability to form questions and that allows us to remove ourselves from certain types of control. Now animals are subject to many of the same sort of stimuli that can train and condition them to give you, you know, you can, you can make a pigeon according to Skinner that appears to know how to read and respond to uh, lexicons. So it gives the appearance that the, the pigeon can read or that the fleas are trained, but really all you're doing is, you know, reinforcing a, a random schedule of conditioning, uh, taking natural characteristics and harnessing them. So 
what you see in the 20th century, not only with the eugenics crowd and all these other things that we've talked about, what you see is the, they go after the root cause of humanity. The root cause of humanity is that we've learned to, you know, uh, speak amongst ourselves and we've learned to uh, observe reality, remove contradictions, and get to that which exists. When somebody obscures that feedback loop between you observing and testing it out and verifying it, when someone obscures that, they can take total control of your awareness. These methods of classical conditioning had advocates in other fields equally or more influential. Soon, the field of compulsory education would team with the ideas first spelled by these social engineers. These children are being taught to accept uncritically whatever they are told. Questions are not encouraged. How can you ask such a question? Have you got a textbook? Yes, ma'am. Does it say here that our law courts are always just? Yes, ma'am. Then how dare you question the fact? Sit down. And so we aren't surprised when... But it must be true. I saw it in this book right here. The education our children is, are going to get has nothing to do with education. It is training uh, our children to be uh, resources, human resources, that's the way they refer to us, to spin off profits for the globalists. The greatest barrier to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge, and that's what the 15,000 hours in compulsory schooling really entrains in, in and conditions into us, is that you've been told this story of the people in South America, and so you think you know about it. And it's not until later in life when you might come across more information about conquistadors and how Jesuits infiltrated all their religious systems and, and took all the riches out and basically harvested this whole area. This is an example of plunder in South America that went on for hundreds of years. So until you have this other piece of information to bring this into focus, you think that what you were taught in public schooling during that 15,000 hours is really what's going on. And it's not until you bump up to, against reality, as George Orwell said, on a, usually on a battlefield, that you have to consider that which you were taught to believe versus the objective evidence that exists. John Taylor Gatto was an award-winning educator in New York who took kids that couldn't even read or write or headed for prison and made them top-level students. And then he discovered that he was shut down by the big tax-free foundations so that he couldn't teach the children this information. And he discovered that it was by design that they were dumbing people down to make them subservient biological androids or replicants. That's what we're seen as. But now we're obsolete. We're to be phased down the new robotic systems, the drone aircraft, the drone submarines, the drone ships, the drone robots on the ground. We're all being conditioned, all being acclimated for this. In The Underground History of American Education, John Taylor Gatto details how, beginning in the early 19th century, American travelers abroad were writing on the methodology of Prussian schools and composing traveler's reports, which were very influential on educational techniques in the United States. However, in 1831, it was French philosopher and minister of education, Victor Cousin, who published his Report on the State of Public Instruction in Prussia, which not only led to the consolidation of French schools under the Prussian model, but also directly influenced reformers like Horace Mann in the United States to follow suit. Mann traveled to Prussia and without even seeing one classroom in session, sought to adopt the Prussian model of education with his annual reports given to the Massachusetts State Board of Education. Mann's promotion of the concept that the state is the father of children was reinforced and expanded by educational reformers throughout the 19th and 20th century. When we speak about enculturated processes, when we, when we talk about the imprinting, uh, of course, you know, I mentioned educators. One of the things that uh, surprises a lot of people, and it shouldn't because it's publicly known, 
is that our education system is not about educating as much as it is about socializing. Like the duckling in the chicken yard. If you, if you take that duckling and raise it with the chickens, it's going to be imprinted, it's going to behave like the chickens. And in that very real sense, we perpetuate this. The danger is we don't just perpetuate it, we don't just enculturate it, but it's the only sane way we see to raise our children. And the result is there's no escaping it. C.S. Lewis said, when training, which is Skinner, have love. Beats education. Civilization dies. Although education has proven to be highly effective in controlling human behavior, more intensive research would need to be conducted away from the prying eyes of the public. The Tavistock Institute was set up by the British Empire to really study mind control and to scientifically drill down into human behavior and put in textbook form systems of basic control so that could be duplicated out to government and corporate entities. And Tavistock has been involved at every level of social engineering. The Tavistock Clinic was founded in 1920 and operated as part of the psychological warfare division of the British military. It was initially a voluntary outpatient clinic for treatment and research and was made up of general physicians, neurologists, and psychiatrists to facilitate the treatment of neurosis and shell-shocked British soldiers returning home from World War I. Going through their own publications on Amazon, you can find that some of their books cost like eighteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And that, what that tells me is they don't want the average person to be anywhere near getting their hands on this book because what it gives you inside those books is the teacher's edition to use an abstraction as opposed to the, you know, the students sitting around the class not knowing what the answers to the questions are. There's a group of people who are being given the answers to all the questions about how we act, react, and how we've been understimulated with curiosity and no more in, in order to make us more subordinative. You could say much of our world today uh, is the world of the Tavistock Institute and Edward Bernays. Having been instrumental in the Tavistock Clinic and director of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, it was former officer and consulting psychiatrist to the British Army, John Rawlings Reese, who created the concept of the Psychological Shock Troops, or Culture Warriors, a federation of psychiatrists, which he intended to disperse across the globe to make it, quote, possible for people of every social group to have treatment when they need it, even when they do not wish it, without it being necessary to invoke law. The Tavistock Institute's influence did not stop simply at social psychology. Kurt Lewin, former head of Britain's Psychological Warfare Bureau, was a German refugee who became the founder of modern social psychology in the 20th century, an early consultant to the OSS, and an influential researcher with the Tavistock Institute in the area of management thinking and action research, specifically focused on the tactics of managing change within society. No organization of the size and scope of Tavistock can operate for long without ample funding. From whom is that funding derived? Certainly no small part comes from the seemingly benign tax-exempt foundations of the global elite. I was researching the Reese Committee uh, back in like 1952, 1953, where they went in and investigated major foundations and some of their subversive activities. These foundations put an enormous amount of energy into controlling what is being taught at the schools uh, and how it's being taught and, and preparing, using schools basically to indoctrinate children to accept their station in life, to accept a, a collectivist future. According to Dr. Lily Kay, whose expertise was demonstrated in her 1993 book, the Molecular Vision of Life, 
the Rockefeller Foundation, Caltech, and the new molecular biology. The world in which we are living has been molded, shaped, and continues to be directed by an elite establishment of eugenicists. A ruling class fueled by violating the will of others to attain their goals. Nowadays, almost every adult agrees on one basic goal for all students. Schools ought to turn out good citizens. Yes, good citizens. That's right. Absolutely, this country always needs good citizens. The real goal was to change America from an individualist system into a collectivist system, and in which case it could be merged with the rest of the world and there would be this great new world order that we hear so much about in recent years. The purpose of creating tax-exempt foundations was not just to collect more money, but to invisibly assert influence over the power centers which control the programming of individuals, specifically to breed the self-reliance out of individuals and prepare them for the collectivist lifestyle planned by the ruling class. Their goal to undermine personal liberty on biological, social, and economic levels. They came together and decided what they were going to do with this money was to gain control of education in America, not for a philanthropic purpose, but to change the thinking of the American people over a generation or two. The globalist social engineers hungered and desired and coveted the power that the liberty in the U.S. had created. They wanted to take it over, and the tax-free foundations wanted to use it as an engine of global domination, and they've done that. And the Reese committees were the only time when Congress stood up constitutionally and demanded all the big foundations come and testify and open their private books. And the Rockefeller, the Carnegie, the Ford Foundation, they all came and said, look, we're here under presidential uh, directive from more than 50 years ago. We've been told to collectivize the United States to merge it with the Soviet Union. We've been told to make America more compatible uh, with authoritarian regimes. And we're just doing what we were chartered to do. Until the creation of language, brute force held the key to fear and thus to the control of individuals through violence and physical aggression. With the innovation of language, the minds of individuals could be harnessed with ideas and beliefs, making less significant the physical dominance of previous generations. This is how, for example, men of small stature could keep otherwise brave and ferocious gladiators as household slaves, whose deaths could be used for profit and entertainment. Out of the ashes of World War II, rose the specter of human experimentation in the form of the 1939 to 1945 exodus of Nazi intelligentsia to continue their research and experimentation under the protection of national security. After being denazified, they were given new identities to live among those against whom they had fought. We brought uh, Werner von Braun over here and several other uh, scientists, including those that were involved in concentration camp medical experiments, including mind control experiments. A lot of these guys were, as far as the State Department was concerned, war criminals. They were linked directly to the Nazis and therefore couldn't get visas, couldn't come into the United States. So the CIA set up this series of programs uh, to route everybody around the State Department visa requirements, get them into the country. Everybody knows about the race at the end of World War II to get Nazi scientists. The Russians wanted them, the United States and England wanted them. And the United States and England got most of them because the Nazis didn't want to go to the Soviet Union, another authoritarian system. They wanted to go to a, quote, freer system. And like an infection, they came to England, Canada, and the United States. And it wasn't just over NASA and rocketry with Werner von Braun and Goddard and others. It was tens of thousands in mind control and torture and military science and surveillance. And the CIA got modeled to a great extent off of the Gestapo. And so we see really the evil of the Nazis being transplanted back to the United States and England where the eugenics philosophy that they had embraced had originally sprung. The Office of Strategic Services 
the precursor of the CIA, under the direction of William Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles, recruited Nazi scientists and aided their importation into America. Among them were rocket scientist Werner von Braun and the aeronautical physician Hubertus Strughold. The problem that the United States was facing was there was all these German scientists who were kind of in the wind, loose, wasn't clear where they were going to end up. And the uh, French, the British, the Russians, and the Americans were all trying to recruit them. The Germans had developed lots of different advanced weapons. And they'd also uh, done a lot of experimentation on human beings in the, in the uh, concentration camps. Uh, so they had a lot of medical data that we didn't have. We, they had, uh, of course, the rocket scientist and the airplane scientist and all the rest of it. And Paperclip was our version of going into Europe and finding these guys and bringing them to the United States to work. What we're missing in the documentation, we have uh, physicians, aerospace medicine people, film people, ball bearings, projectile experts, all kinds of scientists. We're missing from the story of the psychiatrists. But there must have been psychiatrists brought over you know, in parallel to Strukold under paperclip. German financing came from America, came from Wall Street, and came from American corporations. Even the political support that Hitler got in Germany was to some extent traceable to American influences. Prior to World War II, American financiers, banks, corporations, all decided that there was money to be made in pre-war Germany. After all, they all knew that Germany was preparing to become a military aggressor and it needed money to construct vehicles of war. They were spending a lot of money designing and building tanks and airplanes and military carriers and things like that, submarines, ships, and uh, there was money to be made. And so Wall Street and some of the largest corporations like AT&T and even Ford Motor Company got very much involved uh, with the uh, Nazi regime. The experiment that went on became known as Nazi Germany starts in World War I and the Versailles Treaty in Paris 1919, basically giving the Germans the short end of the stick, uh, giving them war reparations that they can't possibly pay, totally unrealistic. Now this famous German banker named Helmar Schacht gets together with a guy from the Bank of England named Montague Norman and they create something in 1932 called the Bank for International Settlements and they use this as a clearinghouse for all the national debts but really it's being used to launder money. What you find then is that same group, Helmar Schacht, becomes Hitler's banker. So Hitler is totally financed by these people who are making their lives out of pulling the wool over other people's eyes. And at the same time, they want to have the National Socialist Experiment to test out the Prussian education system that they are using and about to roll out all over the world. Following the 1945 completion of Operation Paperclip, the CIA created MKUltra, a top secret mind control research project, which was managed by Sidney Gottlieb under the direction of Alan Dulles. The program began in the early 1950s, was officially sanctioned in 1953, and officially terminated in 1973. The program engaged in many illegal, unethical, and immoral activities. In particular, it used unwitting US and Canadian citizens as its test subjects which led to controversy regarding its legitimacy. MKUltra involved the pioneering of many methodologies to manipulate individuals' mental states and alter brain functions, including the surreptitious administration of psychoactive drugs and other chemicals, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and other various forms of torture. When I interviewed John Marks about Search for the Manchurian Candidate, he said a very interesting thing to me. He had been given 10 boxes of CIA information on a Freedom of Information Act request, not his first. He had been trying to get this kind of information on the mind control program of the CIA in the 50s, 1950s, for a long time. And finally, as a kind of a sop, maybe even a joke. They gave him 10 boxes of materials that had nothing to do with 
the projects accept the accounting data, the financial data, thinking that Marx wouldn't be able to do anything with it and they would, CIA would be perceived to have fulfilled the FOIA request. But Marx was too smart for them. He saw into the financial data and realized what he had his hands on, that this was not only MK Ultra mind control program of the CIA, but it was divided up into many, many, many sub projects. And he had some of the funding details that provided the foundation for him to move forward in his research and discover what they were really up to. Uh, the military started the, the artichoke project uh, and the, the Bluebird projects, which I think was the Navy one, and they, they were trying to figure out, can we make a Manchurian candidate? Can we make a super soldier? Uh, can we control uh, uh, what people think and do and how they act on the battlefield? Can we make somebody braver than they really are? And it, it was getting up to where they were asking questions, can we create kamikazes like the Japanese had? In 1994, President Clinton created the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, which was tasked with investigating the instances of federally funded research using ionizing radiation on human beings. Based on the documents made available to the committee, they identified nearly 4,000 cases of human radiation experiments taking place between 1944 and 1974. This included a series of federally funded experiments in which unsuspecting hospital patients were injected with plutonium. Many details of MKUltra experimentation were disclosed during a public hearing before the advisory committee. I'm going to start. My name is Valerie Wolf. In listening to the testimony today, it all sounds really familiar. I am here to talk about a possible link between radiation and mind control experimentation that began in the late 1940s. The main reason that mind control research is being mentioned is because people are alleging that they were exposed as children to mind control, radiation, drugs, and chemical experimentation, which were administered by the same doctors who are known to have been involved in conducting both radiation and mind control research. Written documentation has been provided revealing the names of people and the names of research projects in statements from people across the country. It is also important to understand that mind control techniques and follow-ups into adulthood may have been used to intimidate these particular research subjects into not talking about their victimization in government research. People talk about MK Ultra in two senses. It's kind of like an umbrella term for all mind control programs. But technically, it's just a specific program that ran from the 50s into the 60s. And it stopped in 64. Therefore, MKUltra could not be operational today. But something like MKUltra with a different name surely must be. And I don't think there's any doubt in my mind at all that clearly mind control methods are used at Guantanamo Bay. I mean, there's all the hallmarks of mind control. There's hooding. There's forced sitting positions, there's sensory deprivation, sleep deprivation, all kinds of um, you know, attacking the person's belief system, sexualizing the interrogation, subjecting them to things that go against their religious faith, probably hallucinogens and drugs, can't document that, um, waterboarding. So all the components of a mind control program are in place there. The hearings weren't really about that. And the women didn't have solid, solid, solid documentation, but they told the kind of stories that I hear over and over from mind control victims. So Claudia Mullen and Christine Nicola get up on the stand in Washington and they say, yes, radiation, but it was only one part of mind control experiments that we were subjected to by the U.S. government starting out when we were children. And then somebody on the committee said, uh, from what I've been told by witnesses, pretty much, thank you very much, and now we move on to the next witness. <laughs> right? Like, let's pretend none of this took place. In the 19th century, Franz Mesmer's brand of hypnotism entertained countless audiences, which consequently evolved, both covertly and overtly, throughout the 20th century. CIA's Dr. George Estabrooks 
a graduate of Harvard University and a Rhodes Scholar, finally created methods of reliable hypnotism, enabling its application to the science of social control. George Esterbrooks was a Canadian-born psychologist whose career was at Colgate University in upstate New York. Um, as early as 1943, in his textbook Hypnotism, he described in great, great detail, uh, going back to the Second World War, taking um, Marines or other military people, using hypnosis and other programming on them to create a new personality. So he calls that Jones A and Jones B. And the new program personality would be given an assignment, which could be a courier, penetration, any kind of assignment. And the out front regular person would have total amnesia, complete lack of knowledge of the assignment. Estabrooks was a leading authority on hypnosis, programming soldiers during World War II to act as couriers, who were not aware they were hypnotized operatives on a mission. In this manner, the OSS targeted political objectives through the covert methods of assassination and espionage, leveraging the science of hypnotism. Where hands-off hypnotic and pharmacological methods fail, the physical application of actual electrical stimulus directly to the brain becomes the next logical step. In 1964, Yale neuroscientist Jose Delgado implanted radio-controlled electrodes into the brain of an aggressive bull in an attempt to control its behavior in a ring with a matador. With the push of a button, Delgado himself was able to stop the bull in mid-charge. He didn't stop with the bull, but also conducted experiments on cats, monkeys, and even human test subjects. You had people as young as 11 he was doing this to. One was a 16-year-old girl, and there's pictures in his books where she's kind of staring off into space, vacant. Another, she's strumming on a guitar. Another, she's pounding on the wall all based on what button he's pushing on the transmitter box. Delgado developed what he called a stimosiever that allowed him to target specific emotions and regulate behavior by aiming radio stimulation at different regions of the brain. His idea of the future is, and this he was totally serious about and described in detail, we're going to put electrodes in the entire population, except probably Dr. Delgado, Delgado himself, and a few elite generals, and we're going to control the entire population. And this is not going to be fascism, this is going to be the next step in evolution. Dr. Donald Ewan Cameron was a Scottish-born psychiatrist who was president of the American Psychiatric Association from 1952 to 53, and later first president of the World Psychiatric Association. Cameron was directly involved in the brainwashing attempts of Central Intelligence Agency's top-secret MKUltra mind control program. Under directives from Sidney Gottlieb and funding from the CIA funneled through various front organizations, he spent years researching and experimenting with behavioral modification techniques. It was here that the CIA funded a series of experiments, severe experiments. The work was done by the Institute's then director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. It is the closest experimentation to brainwashing yet disclosed. His work, unprecedented in psychiatry, consisted of three areas which he called sleep therapy, psychic driving, and the ultimate depatterning. Dr. Maurice Dangier, current head of the Allen Memorial Institute. In his uh, psychic driving, uh, so-called, a uh, type of, of therapy, he would give the patient intensive uh, electric treatment in order to make the patient uh, regress deeply, uh, become forgetful. And then he would uh, attempt to implant new ideas uh, in the mind of the patient. Now, to a layman, it would appear that Dr. Cameron was trying to take the slate and wipe it clean, the slate being the mind. In other words, brainwashing. Exactly, that's a very good comparison. Brainwashing. Yes, to life. Dr. Ewan Cameron was a MKUltra contractor. Officially it says that he didn't have top secret clearance, but I'm sure that in fact he did. The reason I say that is he was at different times president of the Quebec Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, 
the Society of Biological Psychiatry, and the World Psychiatric Association. Ewan Cameron was the most famous psychiatrist in the world during the 1950s. You name a psychiatric association of any size or scope, he was the president of it. He became a, a, a psychiatrist. Uh, he, in fact, at one time he was the president of the World Psychiatric Foundation. Uh, and he ended up immigrating over here from Scotland and uh, was, was working in Canada under Sid Gottlieb. And he headed up one of the projects dealing with LSD and with, mind, with different types of mind control projects that he had, especially hypnosis. His experiments were basically, uh, there's kind of two components to it. One is psychic driving and the other is depatterning. So depatterning is you give massive amounts of electric shock to the person, like a hundred plus treatments with six times the usual amount of electricity per treatment. Completely wipe their minds out. So they, they don't know who they are, where they are, they don't recognize their children. And then once they're in that state, you uh, can add on barbiturates and other drugs, keep them asleep for weeks at a time, or kind of like half asleep, and then play tape loops over and over and over and over. That's the psychic driving. And the tape loops will be in the doctor's voice or the person's voice, and this is all supposed to program a new personality. It has been alleged in some cases that Cameron held patients against their will for weeks at a time, drugged and unconscious, under the threat of being committed to an institution for life if they did not participate in his treatments. He began a program of torture, and I don't use the word lightly, on patients who had no idea this is why they were coming to him. They were people who came to him for therapy, for help. And he experimented on them as a torturer would to create new personalities. Cameron operated with Rockefeller funding at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, Quebec, where he contended that it was first necessary to depattern the minds of his patients in order for them to have a shot at recovery. He also participated in the Nuremberg trials of 1945, interviewing many of the top Nazi defendants. After World War II and the creation of the CIA, the need for um, uh, a truth drug and drugs that could perform, that the CIA could use for other purposes, increased. They turned to the Bureau of Narcotics and Harry Anslinger. And again, Anslinger anteed up Agent George White to be his uh, lead agent in this program called MK Ultra. It started basically in 1952 in New York City. White was working with um, a CIA officer named Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb was chief of the technical services division at the time, and he had um, access to a lot of LSD. CIA scientists had decided was um, the drug that they were going to focus on now. Pot wasn't considered quite potent enough to do the things that they wanted to do. White conscripted a couple of um, federal narcotic agents to help him, a couple of informants, uh, narcotic agent informants to help him, and um, went into the streets of New York and got a softcore pornographer named Gil White to help him as well. Apparently White had his own sexual perversions. Um, which have been written about. He was into S&M, so he had a couple of qualifications for the job, which went beyond just being a, um, a federal agent who could perform these functions. He actually was good at acting out the sorts of things that went on in the drug underworld. In 1953, the, the program was formalized, and it was called Midnight Climax. And um, he had, White had a safe house in New York City with which the CIA outfitted with um, a two-way mirror with uh, microphones and, um, and uh, recording devices so that um, White and, his, uh, and the CIA scientists could actually film people who had been surreptitiously dosed with LSD. The program expanded beyond merely LSD. And what they found out was that the safe houses themselves were probably the most valuable aspect of this program. Prostitutes that were in their employ that would bring people to these um, uh, apartments and they could actually record them while they were doing drugs. In 1960, 
the CIA opened another safe house in New York City. And I talked to the people who um, were running this safe house. And one of the narcotic agents said to me that they felt that um, the CIA was actually using this safe house when dignitaries were visiting the UN or politicians were coming to New York City to talk to the mayor or uh, state or even federal officials that they were using the uh, filming them and using uh, potentially using their the films for um, purposes of political blackmail. Another CIA-funded Harvard graduate was Dr. Martin T. Orn, whose expertise in hypnotism, psychiatry, and psychology was a valuable asset to national security. A close friend of Dr. George Estabrook's, Orn's work in hypnoprogramming at Cornell in the 1960s was funded by the Human Ecology Fund and the Scientific Engineering Institute, both of which received funding from the CIA. To provide cover for operations like Midnight Climax, the CIA's MKUltra psychiatrists formed the False Memory Syndrome Foundation to obscure the facts of these covert experiments, creating confusion enough to deny acts of pedophilia, cult abuse, and other inconvenient truths of CIA activities. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation's board was a who's who of MKUltra. There, Dr. Orn was joined by another CIA MKUltra psychiatrist, Dr. Jolyon West, who was the protege of Dr. Ewan Cameron. Like his esteemed MKUltra colleagues, West was infamous for his hypnoprogramming abilities. Using words to make patients believe that their memories of abuse were just figments of their imaginations. The people who started the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, Pamela and Peter Fried, stated to public that Peter had been falsely accused of incest by his daughter, whose name is Pamela. She's now the editor, has been for quite a few years, the editor of the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation, to which I've contributed numerous papers. And it's really the main journal for the study of multiple personality, which was created on purpose in the Manchurian Candidate programs under MKUltra, Artichoke, Bluebird. Contractors on that included Jolly West and Martin Orne, and they're on the board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, which says that all these cases of multiple personality are created by the therapist, and all the memories are false memories. I cannot dismiss what our intelligence agencies have been able to do uh, by way of mind programming in different forms of research, Project Bluebird, MK Ultra, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, let me just say it this way. Jules Romain testifying on behalf of the CIA to Congress said, and this paraphrase is going to be so close to word for word, it's unbelievable. We now know that we can take a man and given sufficient time, educate him to kill his mother and father and eat them in a stew. How will power gravitate into the hands of those who control information? Through the internet, through wireless networks, through smart grids, smart devices, and smart meters to monitor and control the personal behavior of every citizen in the grid. How has the role of harnessing the minds of human resources shaped the 20th and now the 21st centuries? This single pattern emerges from all the seeming chaos. The role of science as juxtaposed to the mind has not been used to help individuals. Rather, at every turn, at every discovery's emergence, knowledge is being used to restrain individuals. Learned helplessness is just one example. And so in the 1970s, um, they discovered through these experiments with dogs that if you put a dog, two groups of dogs in a situation, one group of dog, they had control 
over when they were being shocked, they could use their nose and hit a panel and stop the shock. And another group of dogs, they had the equal amount of shocks, but they, they, no matter what they did, they couldn't control the stoppage of shocks. They discovered this phenomenon called learned helplessness and, and, and that the dogs that who had no control over stopping their shocks, they would become passive and depressed. And that when you put them in another task where all the dogs actually had control, over stopping their shock by kind of jumping over this short barrier, the dogs that had learned helplessness, in other words, the dogs in the previous experiment who had learned that there was nothing that they can do to stop their pain, they did not bother trying. National elections is not equal to democracy. A democracy means you really have some power over things that affect your life, okay? But when Americans think that their democracy equals national elections, and they go and they, and they have senseless wars and corporate control with a Republican in office like George W. And they think, well, we're going to stop these senseless wars and corporate control, and we're going to go and vote for Obama, this Democrat. And they get, what do they get? Senseless wars and corporate control. And so there's a kind of learned helplessness that sinks in there. How are the attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, and values of a society transformed such that the needs of the individual are always in conflict with the demands of the group. The early 20th century trend of conspicuous consumption or the trading of that which is valuable and sensible for that which is superficial and frivolous swept over America and other countries around the world with the help of a few minds who were focused on changing our lives before we were even born. Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, is well known as the father of modern propaganda and public relations, and for his application of psychological techniques to the field of advertising. People have a herd instinct, they tend to move in groups, they, they make conclusions based on emotion and feelings and desires. Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, the archetypal psychologist, psychiatrist, openly bragged that there was a ruling elite that had taken control of society and that could basically program people like machines to walk off the edge of a cliff if ordered to do so. He was the guy that said, don't call yourself the Department of War, call yourself the Department of Defense. And he wrote book after book, like the book Propaganda, 1922, bragging about how we were all dumb animals and how the public mind was in his hand. They couldn't sell pork bellies. They were seen as junk meat, only used as flavoring and soups. They came out and said, no breakfast is complete without eggs and bacon, and, and showed a woman you know, on the newsreel sitting there cooking it. And he said, look, I can make these people do anything I want. And so he is really the archetypal father of brainwashing and propaganda right as the age of television began. And they took his sciences and just wrecked this country. Some of his most famous clients included Procter & Gamble, General Motors, General Electric, the United Fruit Company, Westinghouse Electric, Time Magazine, NBC, and CBS. He looked at what Uncle Freud had plumbed out, how the unconscious worked, and devised in his own mind the idea that you could cause people to do what you wanted them to do because they chose to do it. Uh, indeed, in his work, uh, Propaganda, he makes it clear that it is the duty of the intellectual elite to uh, orchestrate the beliefs and behaviors of the public in order to have a cohesive society. They got together and said, well, you know, people are too darn dumb. We have to program them uh, mentally to do what they're supposed to do. Political science is largely based today on Bernays' work. In 1917, Bernays served on the Committee for Public Information, otherwise known as the Creel Committee, which set out to change public opinion in favor of the United States' involvement in World War I. At the request of Woodrow Wilson, Bernays personally attended the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, the same year that he would found the first public relations firm in the United States. Advancing some of this work, of course, he was uh, commissioned by Woodrow Wilson and uh, to assist in 
selling the idea of World War I that it was about spreading democracy throughout Europe. He is, for all intent and purposes, the father of what we call today neuromarketing. It has been widely reported that Joseph Goebbels had employed Bernays' crystallizing public opinion, the first book written on the emerging field of public relations, while formulating his own propaganda campaigns for Nazi Germany. Moving beyond Bernays, other luminaries in the manufacturing of public consent included Walter Lippmann and Ivy Lee, both of whom complemented these tactics by expanding the breadth and depth of mass media entrainment of individual minds. And then I read 1928, a book by Walter Lippmann, uh, talking about public relation and public opinion and basically saying the same thing that the public is not inherently irrational, but they can use PR and propaganda and media to play upon people's existing irrationality instead of introducing them to the concepts and definitions of that which exists. So instead of creating world peace by putting everyone on the same page, by giving us a method to discern fact from fiction, they use that gap in our perception to play tricks on us. So that's all I've ever seen during human history is human beings playing tricks on other human beings. As for Ivy Lee, he was not only popular with some of America's most prestigious corporations and foundations, he also found time in his busy schedule to personally counsel John D. Rockefeller to represent Standard Oil and was one of the earliest members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Moreover, in the 1930s, Ivy Lee was a consultant to Adolf Hitler tasked with developing strategies to improve Germany's image in the United States and abroad. Kids are impressionable. That's why here at this station, we watch the programs and commercials your child watches carefully. He may see bad guys, but not in the role of heroes. And he'll learn that crime doesn't pay because your child's welfare is our concern, too. That's part of our code. The code of the National Association of Broadcasters for television and the greater public interest. Waco was an odd situation regarding both the law enforcement aspects of it, regarding ATF going in and doing the raid on the Branch Davidian compound, as well as the fact that Special Operations Command was called to help. Uh, this is one of those situations where everything that could go wrong pretty much went wrong from day one. The Clinton administration and Janet Reno started looking for options. Uh, one of the options that they decided to engage on was bringing Special Operations Command in to advise them on quote-unquote psychological operations. When the Special Operations Command uh, elements arrived, they began giving advice to the law enforcement individuals on how to go about implementing specific themes. Within the, the, the psychological operations community, they typically look at themes of how to modify, adapt, or uh, somehow reshape the thinking of a, of a target group, of, a, of an audience. These specific techniques which were brought to bear on the Branch Davidians were developed for military operations overseas, primarily against a foreign target. So another question has to be asked, what is the wisdom of using psychological operations techniques developed for a foreign audience against a US, a U.S. target? Again, a very controversial issue. How does one defend themselves against strategic information, propaganda? It's a very simple answer. Ask questions. Always check your source. Uh, I, as a public figure, uh, am often having to speak publicly about is issues and information. I look at everything. Uh, I, I've been criticized by my friends, oh my God, you look at Fox News, you look at CNN. Absolutely, because the false information being provided to the main, mainstream outlets means something. So why are they saying things a certain way? How are the habits of individuals changed and then reinforced to create new behaviors preferable to the collective? In the 21st century, the method has evolved little from millennia ago. Only the technology has changed. Today's television provides those who leverage public airwaves with an opportunity to control individuals far beyond the simple linguistic programming of radio. 
The major point of television is, is the commercial. The programming is designed to kind of keep people hanging in there long enough to watch a commercial so and that they're in a more passive zombified state to be to buy into the goofy silly um, commercial that is the point of it you are willingly subjecting yourself and your family to psychological warfare assault not just with the semantics not just with the messages but the very flicker rate of the television on record patented to put you into a dreamlike sleep state where you're highly suggestible. You think you're looking at a constant picture. You're really not. Uh, modern televisions, you're looking at LEDs and, and they're going on and off. Because they're going on and off, there's a brain entrainment process that takes place. To make it real simple, it comes down to this. Research shows us that the average person when placed in front of a television set in less than three minutes will go into alpha. Hypnosis is, for all intent and purposes, objectified by brainwave activity. If I'm looking at your brainwaves, an EEG, in normal consciousness, you're operating at what we think of as beta. So you're gonna be 15 to 30 cycles per second, 30 is on the stress side, but that's typically where you're going to fall. In alpha, you're going to be 7 to 14 cycles per second, 8 to 14 cycles, depending on the scale. Now, alpha consciousness, for all intent and purposes, is, is a state of hyper-suggestibility. And it keeps people sedated. You know, they use them in prison. Televisions are used in prisons. They're cheaper than hiring more guards. Um, of course, people are going to be then told that it's okay not to just have one television, but to have three, four televisions in a house and to be not watching it just on a normal television set, but on their phone and on their laptop. And you want to normalize this kind of crazy thing of people spending five, six, seven hours a day watching television. Television has been the ultimate tool of mind control. And for more than 60 years, children are set in front of it as a babysitter while they are bombarded with images of violence and decadence and corruption. And what it does is it just acclimates the child that when they see a real person dying on the street, they don't go over and aid them. We see this happening because, oh, that's entertainment. In fact, people now have been recorded laughing at someone hurt because it's just more entertainment. They've had their basic empathy disconnected, cut off. The role of advertising has certainly evolved away from one of utilitarian necessity in communicating the form, function, and value of a product. The application of the behavioral and psychological sciences has played a seminal role in the way corporations now sell products to consumers in American society and internationally. In 1921, after leaving Johns Hopkins University, John B. Watson, the founder of behaviorism, took a job with the J. Walter Thompson Company, and by 1928, he was vice president of the entire firm. Watson introduced new market research techniques into advertising and discovered that sales could be influenced by manipulating images associated with brand names. For instance, Blindfolded smokers could not tell the difference between brand name and generic. J. Walter Thompson remains one of the most powerful advertising agencies in the world today. Most people believe that you're going along through life making your own choices, making your own decisions, okay? You know, I decided to do this, I decided to do that, you know, I did that. By watching the brain live time, neuromarketers today know exactly what product to place where, what, how to package that product, what colors you're gonna to respond to, what images you're gonna to respond to, what kind of pre-programming already exists that they can, they can couple it to. And so when you have a society where people are being told at every level to consume, to buy their way into happiness, um, and that's their only salvation, that's their only way into happiness is to, then, then you have like a, then you have what I call a kind of fundamentalist consumer society. How does that, how is that problematic? Why is that dangerous? Well, when you have people who only care about buying things, you're going to, you're going to make people weaker um, in a lot of ways. You're going to certainly make them less self-reliant. And when they're told that you just buy things, buy your way into happiness, they don't realize that you can gain strength by doing a lot of things yourself, okay? Um, you also uh, make people self-absorbed. I mean, a point of 
um, all advertising, which is the technology of consumerism, is is to get people to um, care, you know, over focus on every one of their needs and every one of their feelings. So if they're if they're having a bad day, you know, they must focus on that and and and, and focus on how depressed they are. Billions and billions and billions of dollars have been spent privately and publicly looking at how to tap into your psyche, how to cause you to make choices that you wouldn't otherwise make, to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do, to consume, whether it's a product or a plank in a political platform. I've also asked the school board to make a part of every day some kind of anti-violence, anti-gun message. Every day, every school, at every level. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. It's not enough to simply have a, a catchy ad on a Monday and then only do it every Monday. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. To me, with the media just willing to report whatever the government tells it to report, that that gives the government free reign to create whatever story or narrative it wants to create for whatever purpose it wants to create a story for. And that's where we're at. That's why when you put on the six o'clock news and you switch from one channel to another, they take their, their commercial breaks at the same time, they tell the same news stories, and they tell the same news stories at the same time. But then you go to the internet, you go to BBC out of London, or one of the other uh, foreign news services, and you see all kinds of news that we never hear about here. Mass media today is the cutting edge of psychological warfare, and it is nothing but a all-out assault against the general public. When you watch mainline establishment television, you are putting yourself in front of the barrel of a gun. Cognitive dissonance occurs when individuals lack consistency in their methods of thinking, and thus, contradictory elements attempting to reside simultaneously as fact create frustration, confusion, anger, and aggression. It is the difference between what you think the world is and what the world actually is. Cognitive dissonance is really, um, again, a fancy uh, psychologist term for, again, some common sense, which is is this tension that people will experience when they have two opposing kind of ideas. The role of psychology in advertising is to create cognitive dissonance, or the conflict between what you have and what you want, and to fill that void by adapting your behavior accordingly in order to achieve your reward. If an entire society can be properly dosed with mind-altering but culturally approved drugs, this cognitive dissonance may be largely assuaged. With social control as their aim, the ruling class sought to expand their ability to influence the individual. Mind games, those of psychological warfare and advertising, were simply not enough. The opportunity existed to employ chemical treatments physically affecting the hardware of the brain to complement the already existing harmful software in the form of effective propaganda and advertising. The tax-free foundations, including the Carnegie and Ford Foundations, followed the lead of the Rockefeller Foundation in the widespread funding of pharmacological solutions to social control. And they say, we will, we will give you a million dollars for your medical school if you teach pharmaceutical drugs in your medical school. So the doctors come out, they're very happy because they got this wonderful building, all these high paid teachers, the best talent, the best brains you can buy, all funded by tax exempt foundation money. But what comes out of that is that the doctors are taught drugs, drugs, drugs. Psychiatry itself as a profession is one gigantic mind control operation. What happens when the habits demonstrated by groups of individuals reflect the outsourcing of their intelligence to so-called experts and authoritarians who are self-appointed to make decisions on their behalf? You can have a psychiatrist testify in court that somebody has ADHD or clinically depressed or this or that, 
But every one of those official mental disorders is a total lie and a fraud because there is no diagnostic test for any of these disorders. Not ADHD, not bipolar, not depression, not schizophrenia, not anything that you've ever heard of that is a discrete mental disorder. The American Psychiatric Association has a committee um, and they create this thing called the DSM, their Diagnostic Bible. And uh, they decide what goes in there. And they decide that certain people who don't pay attention to boring things have this disorder called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You know, um, And if you accept that you have a disease as opposed to like, well, maybe I'm somebody who can really pay attention to things that are interesting me, but I'm somebody who's stubborn enough um, to not really want to pay attention to things that are boring for me. And that maybe that's a good thing. That's how you maybe become, have something really a worthy contribution as opposed to allowing people who are bores to fill up your whole life. You only want to listen to things that actually really are interesting for you. If you accept these ideas though, that you have a disease or there's something essentially wrong with you, um, you're going to be more a prey to authorities controlling you. And some of these drugs, such as the SSRI antidepressants like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, and so on, are known to induce violent behavior, including suicide and homicide. And you have a profession like psychiatry that is seeding the country, like planting seeds in a garden, and a farm, with these diagnoses and these drugs, you're, this is Operation Chaos. Part of the problem of psychology, psychiatry, when it comes to um, diagnosis is, is that they really seem to have no political awareness of their pathologizing of anti-authoritarianism, of stubbornness, of rebellion. Um, this is, I think, uh, a part of the reason for that is I think that an overwhelming number of psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health professionals are more kind of compliant people. And when they see um, non-compliant, more stubborn, more oppositional kinds of uh, patients, especially young people, that creates a lot of anxiety for them. And so you have this power and you do this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. These little seeds, which are drugs, you see, that affect the brain in various unpredictable and horrendous ways. And you have that power to do that for 50 years. Don't you think you could really call that mind control? That's mind control par excellence. If habit is thus the enormous flywheel of society and habit keeps us all within the bounds of ordinance, then it is our habits which enslave us to the so-called children of fortune. For their fortune exists only because our habits prevent us from outpacing the status quo and growing in the light direction. How might we begin to change our habits such that our actions are no longer in conflict with our needs as individuals to survive and thrive in this world? And what will happen if we do not resist? We're heading toward a system where we're going to have economic collapse, real crisis, be much worse than anything we've seen we're going to be in a position where most people won't understand how it came about. They won't realize that it's the result of government policies, of corrupt politicians. And so therefore, they're going to go to those same corrupt politicians and endorse the same policies. And we're going to get more of the same. And that is where we're headed. It all goes back to people who are smarter than us, who are polymaths, who are organized and have a lot of office supplies and infinite money because they can print it out of thin air and everyone else takes it and says, this is real. That's not real. Your mind is real, objective reality is real, wisdom is valuable because we can learn how to survive together with that. But all these things that they make us think are valuable, like petroleum or any of these other commodities, they're all fear-based. And if we just really understood what was going on in our voluntary role in it, we wouldn't play such a role in our own servitude. So we come to a point in our lives where it's fair to ask, what was the last original thought you had? 
would, the way you walk, the way you talk, the vocabulary that you use, all of these things are built into the expectation you have of yourself based on the role you have chosen to play in the theater of life as it's been defined to you. Well, I think we're seeing what the consequences are of, of just complying with everything right now because that's what most people in America do at this point in time. The consequences are every day you're losing more of your constitutional rights and your freedom is being taken away more and more and more by this all-encompassing security state being brought to you by your United States government. If you out there watching don't wake up and begin to investigate these facts and prove them for yourself and take action against these people, you are not just committing suicide against yourself, but against all of good humanity. The consequences to non-resistance of control is losing everything that makes us human, that we love, that we cherish. Now think about which laws have been passed recently to give you more rights. There aren't any. There aren't any at all. A lot of folks who are, are critical thinkers, they realize what how powerful these kind of giant corporate government entity is out there. And that kind of understanding that a critical thinker has can, can be quite painful and can lead to them being depressed and apathetic and giving up. And so we see that throughout history that a lot of your really great critical thinkers sometimes succumb to depression and substance abuse because they're so overwhelmed, as opposed to others who figure out that conundrum that if I'm going to be a critical thinker, I'm going to see how powerful these oppressive authorities in my life are, but I can't allow that pain to make me just kind of give up into kind of fatalism and defeatism. Information, knowledge equals power and control. Whatever the public face of something is, whatever they're talking about publicly, there's something else over here they're probably not looking at. And that's why it's important for individuals to look beyond what is being presented publicly. Uh, it's input, processing, and output. And what we're trying to do is keep a clean signal, that's knowledge of that which exists, and to filter out the noise. And we do that by dismissing the arbitrary, things that aren't substantial, and identifying fallacies, because the way that people can effectively lie is through words, and it's through our own belief in these words that makes it take control of our lives. So in understanding these essential aspects of how they control us, we can learn individually to become free and to communicate amongst each other how to do that more efficiently. Don't buy the propaganda. Don't believe what's in the mainstream media. It sometimes is true, but often not. There's only one thing that we can do to change the courts that we're now on, and that is to recapture the system. All of the positions of power in America today, and to a large extent around the world, are in the hands of collectivists, people who believe in the very system we have. They like it. First thing we have to do is we have to, we have to take the schools back, and then we have to educate the kids that, hey, this happened in the past. These are the things that happened. You have to have a conscience and you have to take a stand. And no matter how many people are, want to get you in the group, don't, don't be part of that. Because you're going to lose your individuality if you become part of the group. You have to kind of forgive yourself. And once you do that, you can have greater compassion for other people who are still um, being victimized, who are still believing um, that those who are controlling their lives actually care about them. A large segment of the population uh, that are so-called conspiracy theorists, but I, I don't have a problem with these people. They should be questioning things that are going on because we, we can't trust the media to accurately report stories. Activism can help a society that's already falling under the weight of its own stupidity fall a couple of generations earlier. All right, to be able to move into a healthier society. When you get down to the ideas of what we can do uh, to free ourselves, you have to first look at what exists. So what exists is this system is organized, it is there to control the crowd. And if you do not resist it, you lose all individuality, you lose your identity, you outsource your thinking, you are being denied your life. And that is every bit as serious as someone trying to stab you in the back because without your life, liberty, and the ownership of your own work and your own labor, you have no rights under their systems. Freedom means freedom, not some freedom, but all freedom. As long as you don't take away the life, liberty, or property of your fellow man, you should be free to do everything that you want to do.
That's what built this country in the first place. So the solution to the problem is to return to that high ideal, return to that high ground. Then everything is possible. You don't have to like the system you're in, and frankly, you have every right to speak out against it. Freedom of the individual is where you start. And then the individual can say, what am I going to do with my own freedom? How am I going to use my imagination and my creative power to invent realities of my own and make them fact in the world, as opposed to sitting back here passively and letting elites manufacture reality for me. Humanity is worth resisting this, and if you don't stand up against these diabolical globalists, you are turning our species and our entire history and our entire future over to these people. You're betraying our ancestors who fought against incredible odds so that we might have some basic freedoms. And you're betraying yourself, your children, your family, and all future human generations. We can't turn our species over to total darkness. We can't turn our, our species over to people who, who love to hurt innocents and who, who hate beauty. We must resist the new world order. We must free our minds and awaken the human spirit. It is time for the sleeping giant that is humanity to awaken